it's really a great uh, pleasure to be here at the Asia Society, which uh, is a long pending invitation which I've done today. Uh, I'll, I'll speak to you uh, in the next 30 to 40 minutes on the Aadhaar program and why, why it's being done and why it's, we think it's so important. Uh, let me try to explain to you what is the problem that we are trying to solve. One of the challenges in India, and I later realized is a challenge in many developing countries, is that when people are born, they often don't have a birth certificate. Uh, this is a problem in many parts of the world, and even in many states within India, uh, more than half the births often are not registered for a variety of reasons, because the baby is not born in a hospital, it's born at home, and you know you can't go and register it, and there are challenges and so forth. So you have a situation where you have millions and millions of young people who are out there who don't have any proof of identity or any proof of who they are. Now, this was not such a big deal earlier because if you lived in a village and you spent your entire time there, everybody knew who you were. It was like cheers. You know, everybody knew your name. <laughs> and uh, it didn't really matter. But today, we have a population which is uh, hugely aspirational, which is hugely mobile, moving from village to city, moving from North India to South India, from Central India to Coastal India, trying to move, go abroad, all that. And not having uh, an acknowledgement of existence, not having some proof of ID is a huge impediment. It's, it's a huge uh, divide because without the ID, they don't get access to uh, mobility, to public services, to whatever, whatever they're entitled to. So identity itself had, had, is a divide. And when you talk about doing inclusion, you cannot do inclusion without addressing the problem of identity. So the challenge that was there before us is how do we get everybody on board? How do we give all these people who don't have an ID an ID? That was one part of the problem. The other thing was that over, over the last 13 years, uh, as the Indian uh, sort of economy grew at 7 8% and taxes grew and so forth, uh, you know, the social welfare programs of the government also uh, went up, uh, uh, rightly so. And there's been a big significant increase in uh, expenditure on entitlements, on things like food programs, health programs, education, guaranteed employment, and then on subsidies like food, fertilizer, and fuel. And these subsidies and entitlements have uh, gone, you know, there are 60, 70 billion dollars a year that is being spent on these programs. And these programs are ultimately about giving a benefit of an entitlement like a scholarship or a subsidy like uh, cheap uh, fuel to an individual. But when people started sort of rolling this out, they realized that the underlying list of individuals wasn't really very accurate. It had a lot of frauds and a uh, lot of duplicates, and therefore a lot of the money that was supposed to reach individuals was not really reaching them because the list of people itself was not very robust. And therefore, also from the point of view, of making government expenditure more efficient, more effective, more equitable, you, re you required an underlying identity system to make sure that the benefits really reach the people who deserve to get it. So there were two drivers. There was a driver of massive social inclusion of giving people who didn't have an ID an ID, and there was a driver of making government expenditure more accountable, more efficient, and more, eff more effective. And both these drivers came together, and the government very wisely decided to create uh, a program uh, to give everyone a unique ID, which meant give every resident of India a unique ID, and that meant giving a unique ID to 1.2 billion people. Now, IDs have been around for a long time, and uh, you know, IDs actually, when you think about it, surnames are the first form of IDs, because you know, earlier you said John, son of William, and William, son of, you know, some uh, Tom, uh, whatever, Harry or whatever. But over the last, around the mid 15th or 16th century, uh, you required a better way to identify people and that's how surnames began. So you had Tom Baker and Harry Butcher and somebody else. Who, so surnames actually was a way to get people to have an identity. And it happened for two reasons. One was because uh, when you had all those wars, you had to find a way to get soldiers. So you had to draft all these guys. So you had to know where they were. So you, you, know, you need an ID to, to bring them into the, into the army. And the second reason was the church wanted to 
find a way of getting, uh, you know, getting its share of its taxes. So that's why you made sure that you had a birth registration in the church. So fundamentally, both from, so always the ID has been from the point of view of recruitment into drafting people into armies and for the purpose of taxation. Now in the 20th century was the rise of the welfare state. You had, uh, you know, in, the, in America, the U.S. passed the Social Security Act in 1936, and then they had to have a system where somebody could work all their life, and then they retired and could, could get their defined uh, benefits, and that required a way to identify them, and that's how the Social Security number started in the U.S. in the 1930s, in Sweden in 1940s, in the U.K. in 1950s. So in any society that was building a welfare state, there was an underlying numbering scheme, if, as it were, because you had to have a way of identifying people. And now we were here in the 21st century, we didn't have something like that, and now we had these twin challenges of social inclusion as well as of making government expenditure more efficient, and that's how the project was conceived. So there was a very good reason for that. But the important thing was that when we, and then the government invited me to lead this project, but the important thing then was how do we do this? You know, it's nice, the, the, you know, the problem statement is very simple give every resident of India a unique ID. It means within a reasonable amount of time, give 1.2 billion people an ID. And uniqueness is very important. In other words, you must, be, you must give only one ID to one person, and one ID must point to only one person. In other words, you have to have a one is to one relationship between a person and his ID. And if you had a system where all your births were registered, for example, in most European countries or North America, 98% of births are registered. Then all you could say is, and therefore the birth certificate is tantamount to a unique document because you can only have one birth certificate. And therefore you could just say, bring your birth certificate and I'll give you an ID uh, with that birth certificate. But what do you do when you have millions of people who don't have any starting documents? And that's really the challenge we had. And we came to the conclusion that if you really want to have a robust ID system uh, which gave a unique number to everyone, we had to use s attributes of a person which, which were not, you know, which could not be changed. And obviously that meant using biometrics. Now biometrics in the world has a uh, long history, well, maybe 150 years. Uh, bio the first use of biometrics was fingerprints. In fact, the first use of fingerprints was in India, in, in Bengal in the 1860s and 1870s, when the British used that for registration and all that. But fundamentally, the first generation use of biometrics or fingerprints was really forensics. It was about you know, crime detection. You, know, you read all those Perry Mason books where they took a glass and there was a fingerprint on the glass and they figured out who'd done the murder and all that. So generation one of biometrics was really uh, in the, in, uh, using it for forensics. What happened after 9-11 was that biometrics then became a very important uh, instrument for uh, surveillance or immigration control or security. For example, whenever a, a non-American visitor lands up at JFK airport, they give the biometrics uh, when, they, when they want to get their I-94 and all that, when they want to get the visa stamp. So biometrics has been used for those kind of applications. We, in some sense, pioneered the use of biometrics at scale for a development goal, which was to give everyone uh, an ID. That was, so it's a, sort of a third generation use of uh, biometrics. And in fact, the fourth generation of use of biometrics will be in the consumer industry. So your next smartphone and your next tablet and next glasses will all have biometrics, but that's a separate issue. So we looked at it from a development perspective, and we said, let us use biometrics to ensure that a person is unique. And we came to the conclusion, after a fair amount of work, that if we had the fingerprints of all the, you know, all the 10 fingerprints and the iris of both the eyes, then there was sufficient digital diversity there, uh, sufficient uh, biometric signature, which would give us uniqueness over a billion people. You still have to find that out, but you think it'll work. <laughs> so we, we therefore said, and this is called as multimodal biometrics. You have fingerprints and you have the iris of both the eyes. And so we developed this program where we enroll people to give them an ID. It's a program for all residents. So this is not a number of citizenship. This is just a number for any resident. And all that the number does is say X is X. It allows you, it just says that X is X, or Jack is Jack, or Ram is Ram, or whatever. 
And when, when you enroll into the system, you essentially provide very simple information for your identity. You provide your name, your date of birth, your sex, your address, your 10 fingerprints, and the iris of both your eyes. And if you would like to have communication from us, then you, have, you give your email ID and your mobile number. So it's a very simple set of data that we collect, only for the purpose of identification. But the important thing is, how do we make sure that you get only one number? Think about it. How, how would you do that? Because the reason why we have to have a systematic way of doing it is that if you start a project in a population where a large number of people don't have an ID, if you don't have some kind of way to solve the problem, a person could come and enroll 15 different times under 15 different names and get 15 different numbers. And they could then use the number, different numbers at different points. And therefore, you lose the whole purpose of this ID thing. So getting that uniqueness was very important. Now, to establish uniqueness is really at the heart of what we do, because that's really where the technological sophistication comes. Because when somebody enrolls into a system, we check their unique biometric signature against the entire gallery of people that we have to see whether that person has enrolled earlier or not. So think about this. If we have a size, uh, we call it as a gallery, but whatever the file or the table or whatever you want to call it, of 300 million people, and in a given day, if 100 million people enroll, I'm sorry, in a given day, 1 million people enroll, then each of those million people has to be compared against all 300 million to see whether it's a duplicate or not. And for each of them, you have to compare all the 10 fingerprints and the iris of both the eyes. So if you're processing a million people, you're doing trillions of pattern matching to identify whether a person is already in your system or not. And that's what we do. That's, what, that's our core, core competence. So today, we have built a system where we already have enrolled 380 million people and issued unique numbers to about 325 million people. And our daily run rate of enrollments is about a million. So we do about a million a day or about 20 million a month. We have about 30,000 enrollment stations around the country where people walk in, enroll, and after a few weeks and months, we process it, we make sure it's not a duplicate. If it's not a duplicate, we generate a 12-digit random number and send them a mail. And if they give them the mobile number, we send them a text message saying that your number has been generated and you can do an electronic printout of your number. So this is how this system works. So we, are, we have done about uh, 380 million enrollments. Our goal is 400 million enrollments very shortly. And by sometime in 2014, we hope to do about 600 million because we do about 20 million a month or about, say, 200 million a year. So over time, we hope to cover the entire population. So that's how the, the scale of this operation uh, is there. And because we do this biometric deduplication, we have a 99.99% guarant uh, sort of accuracy that there will be no duplicates, which means on the whole population of 1.2 billion, we will have a few duplicates because this is not a 100% thing. We'll maybe have 100,000 duplicates, but then those will sort out by using some other methods. So fundamentally, you now have a mechanism by which everybody gets an ID. Now, the other important thing is you will ask, how do, how, how, do, how do you get into the system? Because if you already have an ID, you can bring your driver's license, you can bring your passport, you can bring your birth certificate and all that. But I talked in the beginning about people who don't have any document whatsoever. So what do you do with them? And therefore, we provide a way for those people to enter the system. And we have a concept called an introducer. So an introducer is an NGO or a government employee who basically says, yes, I know this person, and this I know his name is this. This is his approximate date of birth, because they don't have birth certificates. And they have an address, they're homeless. We, the address is care of an NGO or something. And that's how they enroll into the system. And that becomes the first ID. Now, you may ask, what if the information is wrong? Right? Well, now, what does wrong mean here? I mean, a date of birth is a date of birth. I mean, if you don't have a date of birth, then you can you know, put an approximate date of birth. But whatever it is, the name that you enroll into this system that's your name for the rest of your life in the system. 
because this is the only number you're going to get. So obviously the name that you enroll into the system is going to be your name hereafter. And that's how everybody sort of comes in from the outside into the into this formal system, and they will get a name. So if you choose to enroll with using a different name, that's going to be your name thereafter. So you know, you be my guest if you want to use some other name. <laughs> now, when you think about it, think about it as to what happened in the United States or in Canada when you had migrants coming, you know, you had all these lots of guys and men and women coming, uh, landing at Statue of Liberty, not far from here, you know, all those steaming masses and all that. And they would come from Ireland, they would come from Italy, they would come from Poland, they would come from wherever. And they often they would have names which nobody could re understand or long names, you know, stuff like that. And they would come and they would land at, at you know, the you know the tired and huddled masses at the Liberty Statue, and the immigration guy would say, Okay, from now on. In the new world, your name will be Sam David. It's true. I know a lot of people whose name changed when they came here. So when those people landed in the new world, that became the name thereafter. So think of what we are doing as a 21st century Ellis Island. So you have all these millions of people who don't have an ID, who are coming into the real sort of, they're there, they're physically in the same country, but they're coming from being outside the system of having no ID to coming into a formal system. And that's really what it is. It's social inclusion on this large scale. Now, so this is how we solve the problem of giving IDs to everyone. And as I said, we've done 380 million enrollments, 325 million IDs, and uh, we do a million a day and all that. But the other important thing about this is that this is not about issuing them a card. It's not about giving a card. It's about giving a number which is on the cloud, which is online. And this is the difference between anything else that's happening there. The fact that this number is online, which makes it a digital ID, a digital ID which can be used for verifying your identity or authenticating your identity online wherever you go. And the way it works is, apart from enrolling people, we provide this authentication service where we can verify your identity using biometrics online wherever you go. So what that means is I could be a villager in Bihar and I get my ID doing this enrollment. I then migrate to Delhi. I can still use my ID because it's on the, it's on the cloud, it's online. And if I go somewhere and I want to avail of a particular service or I need something which requires my ID to be verified, then I just go and say, I'm X, my number is 123, here's my fingerprint, and an online request is made to our central system, which replies in a few seconds that yes, the person standing in front of you is indeed X. This is called as online authentication. Online authentication is very, very important. Because once you have online authentication, then you can use that as a way to verify identity of a person before having a transaction with them. And this, therefore, is used to use this ID and make it as a gateway to various services. So example, uh, you can use this ID to open a bank account. You can use this ID to op get a mobile connection. You can use this ID to get a gas connection. You can use this ID to apply for a passport. You can use this ID to buy a train ticket. So suddenly, this online identity becomes a gateway, a method by which you get access to various services. And that's really uh, the value of having an online ID. Because once you have an online ID, it, it's mobile, it works everywhere, the connectivity is there. It allows you to add more and more applications so that you, tomorrow you can add a new application so that which requires ID verification. And you're not limited by space because you, know, you can put any number of services on the, on the, on, online. And therefore you are really, and that's why you think about this as an ID platform. It's a platform. It's a platform where using that basic ID, I can build lots and lots of applications around it. And our view is that these applications will be very useful and very innovative applications. And we have designed an infrastructure which allows public companies, private companies, startups, you know, government, everyone to use this and build all kinds of applications. 
So the way we visualize this is that now we have these 325 million people who, who have been issued the ID. People are going to build applications that, uh, which can be used by these 325 million people. And therefore, the fact that we have such a large number of people with online IDs will drive all kinds of innovative applications. And as more applications come on board, it gives even more impetus to those who don't have the ID to get the ID, because once they get the ID, then automatically all those various services which are there become accessible to them. And therefore, you create a virtuous cycle where enrollments drive applications, applications drive enrollment, and creating this virtuous cycle, the momentum, is what we think will ultimately enable us to get the entire 1.2 billion people into the system, because you really need momentum to you know, get all this going. And that's how we visualize this whole thing happening. Now, the first use of this ID in a big way for an application is for direct benefit transfer, or transferring money to people, or, or benefits to people. And that's what is being rolled out today in the country. Uh, the first set of uh, applications was done in 43 districts, and now recently the government has added another 81 districts. And what happens there is using this ID, money is sent electronically into your bank account. Now, once you have a unique ID, you can now link a bank account to the ID. And then you can send money to the ID. So let's say I have an ID, which is number 123, and have a bank account in the State Bank of India. Then all the government, this person is a pensioner. He gets a monthly pension of 1,000 rupees. Then all the government has to do is send money saying, send 1,000 rupees to Aadhaar number 123. Aadhaar is the number. It's Aadhaar means foundation. So all the government does is send 1,000 rupees to Aadhaar number 123. And then somewhere on the cloud, Aadhaar number 123 maps to the bank account of the person, and that 1,000 rupees gets credited to the bank account. And the advantage of that is that it's, there's no fraud, because the money is going to the bank account of that person who is in your database. And therefore, we, we can now do this at scale. So we can do literally millions of transactions every day where all kinds of programs, pensions, scholarships, entitlements, all kinds of things can be directly electronically credited into your, into your bank account. And this, this is really end-to-end -end processing of uh, this. So essentially, this is a platform which the financial part of it, which allows you to transfer money to anyone in the country just using the number. So the number becomes an address. It's a financial address which sort of encapsulates the account details in it. Now, the same thing can be done, for example, for subsidy reform. One of the challenges in India and many parts of the world is that subsidies are uh, priced into products, right? So when you buy something, it's cheap because it's cheap because there's a subsidy in that. But the, when, you, when you price subsidies into products, like you make the energy kerosene cheaper or the gas cheaper, it, it creates all kinds of distortions. You know, economists talk about these things and ask Ajay about it. So what we have done is we have created a model where the product will now be sold at market price, and the subsidy is given as a cash transfer into the bank account, which means you unbundle. So you, 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 you serve the purpose. You give subsidies because you, peep, you, you want to make sure that people who are uh, you know, stretched in and are now poor are not going to be burdened with high cost of energy or food. At the same time, you want to make sure it only goes to those people and the rest of the business operates normally. And therefore, by separating the subsidy from the product, you can continue to sell the products at the normal market price and make sure that for those people to whom you want to give income support or price support, you give that much money into the bank accounts. And that fundamentally changes the way that you can make these subsidies work. So that's, again, a very important uh, benefit of this. So what, what's really happening here is that we are creating an ecosystem, an ecosystem of identity on which applications are built. And over time, we expect more and more applications to be built and make it more and more useful. A good example, a good simile from your world is the GPS, or you know, global positioning systems. If you know the history of GPS, GPS was actually designed for military purposes. It was part of Star Wars. You remember Star Wars? And GPS was a network of 
geostationary satellites, which uh, gave the exact location of a target. It, they were able to triangulate down to the exact latitude and longitude of a target so that the missiles could go and boom, hit the target. In 2000, GPS technology was put by the US government into the commercial domain. It was, it was made available for commercial applications. And today there's a multi-billion dollar economy around GPS. You know, in, in you have it in your car, you have your car navigating systems, your TomToms and your Gammons. You have it in your maps, you know, Google Maps or Bing or Apple Maps. You have it in location-based services. You have it in, you know, uh, inertial navigating systems. The self-driving cars which you're seeing now are all using GPS. So GPS which began with a military application, once it was put out and once it was opened up, created a whole ecosystem of innovation around it. And all that GPS did was answer the question, where am I? And it said, this is your latitude, longitude. Similarly, the Aadha system answers the question, who am I? And then allows you to build applications around it. And just like in the GPS, when the GPS was put in the commercial domain in 2000, nobody really knew what would come out of it. Nobody knew it would have a map and cars would be driving around on you know, Route 101 and all that. So, the, so we're not able to visualize, therefore, what are the possible uses of this. So our view is that innovation will drive that. And innovation will drive services in a way that, that, uh, that, that you know, will change everything. So why this is important uh, is that this is an example of how technology is being used at scale for really bringing inclusive growth and development. Because by using these sophisticated technology platforms, leveraging the fact that modern technology, internet has created these huge databases. Today, you know, we talk about a billion users on Facebook. We talk about a billion uh, pay views on YouTube. So the internet organizations that have, have really built platforms which allow us to think about creating databases of a billion people. And they've done that by really stretching technology, by using you know, cheap computers, uh, making storage cheap, and so forth. So this ability to use you know, cheap storage, cheap computers, connectivity everywhere, even in India, mobile connectivity is now almost ubiquitous. And then, of course, the arrival of all these new devices, smartphones, tablets, touch interfaces, all these have created a radically new sort of capability. And you can then use it for these kind of programs like the ID program and then bring literally hundreds and millions of people onto the platform. And then once you have them on the platform, get many people to build applications on that. And that's how you can, go to, you can drive the, the you know, development. Because once you put the ID platform online, wherever connectivity is there, it works. So what that does is, for example, in, in our cash transfer situation, you don't need to have a bank branch in every village because opening a bank, bank, bank branch in every village is a very expensive proposition. You can just have an agent in the bank, uh, of the bank branch in the village who has a small mobile phone kind of a device. He can authenticate your identity and he can give you your money. And therefore, suddenly, you've made it very, very convenient for that guy in the village that instead of walking 40, kilo, 40 kilometers to the nearest town to operate his bank account, he has an agent next to him who can operate his account for him. So suddenly you're made, in, instead of you going to the bank, the bank is coming to you. And that's the kind of power of what is possible here. It also means that you can design systems in a way that you have choice. One of the problems with public delivery in many parts of the world is that that beneficiary has no choice. If you're getting your pension, you only have to go to this branch of bank, you only have to go to this postman, you only have to go to this government employee. And you're creating, uh, essentially, when you have only one supplier, then the supplier dominates you because you can't go to anybody else. Once you have this ID-based system where the ID can be authenticated online anywhere, and you have a network of suppliers, then you as the beneficiary, you as the customer, can go to any one of these people to operate your bank account and withdraw your money. And therefore, when you create choice for the beneficiary to be able to operate like that, then the bargaining power shifts from the supplier to the beneficiary. And therefore, this is fundamentally about empowerment. It's about creating a different model of public delivery where the person is in charge and he can choose where to go. So I think the other project, therefore, is an example of how you use 
the most modern technology, you know, all these biometrics and internet architectures and mobile phones and smartphones and broadband and all that good stuff, but use it in a way to change the lives of millions of people who are the most marginalized. And to me, that is really the, the future because you now have these extraordinary tools which the technology industry has brought about. And the thing is, that's not stopping. You know, you have Moore's law. Moore's law says that computing power will double every 18 months. And you know, all the guys say this is going to go on for some more time. Now remember, 18 months means that it doubles every 18 months, but it, it, that means it changes by a factor of 10 every five years, which means it changes by a factor of 100 every 10 years. So we can't visualize this because this is not like, it's not a spreadsheet. This is changing you know, in a very different way. And therefore, all these changes, which, will, which means that computing power will become more and more uh, you know, powerful, storage will become cheaper, broadband will become more, uh, more broadband, the device in your hand will become much more powerful, it will become much more intuitive in its user interface, suddenly means that you, you can change, change this whole development activity because somebody out there who's not literate perhaps can, you know, it can help them to get literate, get them access to services, everybody can have a phone. So I think this, these are very radical things, very radical changes that are going to come. And the Aadhaar program is just an example of how this transformative power of modern technology can be applied at scale for really bringing uh, you know, some developmental benefits to millions of people. So that's what we do at Aadhaar. Now I'll stop here and take questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nandan. This has been uh, such an interesting uh, presentation. I mean, the thing is about uh, India or other parts of the world is that we end up with lots of problems, but then come these visionary people like Nandan, who just open the open the the, the, the doors for to a new vision. And I think what you have heard today is really a, a new vision. And uh, you know, it's something that, as you were saying, Nandan, which has the potential to really transform uh, the way we think about uh, the relationship between the state and the citizen uh, in, a, in very many fundamental ways that we haven't even thought about yet. And it, in a way, the social contract itself between the state and the citizen may be fundamentally affected by what you have unleashed here in India. But let me ask you, you know, um, recently uh, after the floods in Pakistan, you know, a lot of people in Pakistan lost their identity papers in the flood. The war in Sri Lanka, a lot of people lost their identity papers. And we have been working on programs to help people restore their identity. But these are people who had an identity, who lost it because of war or because of a natural disaster. But what you're talking about is people who never had one before, who never you know, knew who, who am I, really. I mean, they knew who they were informally, but yeah. the system didn't know didn't who they know. were. So what has been of the first, say, 100 million people, have you already started to do some kind of quick analysis of what's happening with these people, how are they being affected by them? Perhaps no, I think uh, it's, it's early to say, but I think certainly uh, it's uh, benefiting them from mobility point of view. You know, they can now travel to work somewhere else. It's benefiting them in ease of getting bank accounts open, uh, ease of mobile connections. And I, th I think the mobility is very important because a lot of them may not have had an individual document but they would be part of a group document. They would be part of a family that has a ration card, but they're one out of five members. Mm -hmm. And the ration card is a, not a portable document. It's only within a state. So they had like those kind of IDs. So I think unlocking that and giving them an, each individual an ID which was nationally portable mm -hmm. is, is really, in some sense, the, the big thing. And, and, and I don't want to hog the questions, but a quick one, and then I'll throw it open. I mean, anything you do in India must be a huge challenge. And anything on this scale must be an even bigger challenge. So what have been the biggest challenges that, I mean, it's certainly probably not the technology, given that you are a technology wizard yourself, but. No, I think uh, 
Obviously, the technology is un unprecedented in the sense the largest biometric database in the world is 120 million, and we are doing one 10 times as large as that. So it is pushing the uh, edges of that. But that is, as you rightly said, you know, we have some very, very bright people working with us, and they've been able to, and we have very good partners around the world. So that's been, I think, it's almost pretty much there. I think the question was how to, what's the architecture, how to design something in the public space to drive speed. And so we had to design a scalable architecture so that have, we can have any number of enrollment agencies, any number of enrollments happening. So there was a certain architecture for that. We had to create an ecosystem. <coughs> uh, you know, our organization has less than 300 people, but our ecosystem has 100,000 people. They don't work for us directly, but they work for our partners. So creating a partner ecosystem. At the same time, how do you manage the ecosystem? Then you need very high level of real-time granular data to know who's doing, prop who's doing it properly, what is the quality issues. So this is itself is, is, a, is a way of doing things. And I, I personally believe that that need not be limited to this project. It's, it's actually the, the, the philosophy that we have followed applies to any large developmental rollout. You, know, you can apply the same principles. Uh, because we, we were very clear that we didn't want to create a huge organization of our own. Mm -hmm. We want to just partner with people and, and get the job done. And, you know, th things like that, you know. And so I think this partnership approach, creating an ecosystem, leveraging the strengths of the system, using the governments, using the banks, mm -hmm. you know, therefore piggybacking in some sense on what was there. That was an important mm -hmm. requirement to reduce time to deployment. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, thank you. Let me not hog, yes, please. There's uh, lots of hands, I'm sure. I don't know, is there going to be a mic here? Uh, there's over here. Yes, please. The lady in the red. Uh. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I enjoyed your talk. And um, um, I'm from Columbia. And huh? the question, I'm from Columbia University. And the question I have is, um, you know, you, you said, you mentioned that uh, the uh, you die generally, uh, the focus is on uh, domestic residents rather than uh, citizens as a whole. So I'm wondering about cases where, uh, you know, people have gone uh, to other countries in the Middle East or the UK or Europe, for example, um, you know, maybe migrant workers, you know, construction workers and laborers and things like that, and they have to return to India. So. Uh, does the scheme consider, I mean, what's, is there any process in place yeah, to... Yeah, so if they're, res if they, if they're gone out and come back and they have some residency in the country, they can enroll. See, all, all that you're doing is giving an ID. All, all the ID is saying is that X is X. And you, I can now use that X is X in all kinds of online transactions. That, that's really what this is doing. So as long, even if they come back, they can enroll into the system. Uh, one down here? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. I also enjoyed your talk. I wonder if you could speak a little bit about the privacy and security issues surrounding the system, especially would um, the biometric information be available to the criminal justice system, and um, what safeguards do you have against hacking? So pe no one... Yeah, see, the, the biometric data uh, was an essential part of the design because that was the only way we could establish uniqueness. So it's really used in two ways. It's used for establishing uniqueness, which is a one-time activity, and second, for doing authentication. You go somewhere, you, I, I, we can use your biometric to verify that you're the person you claim to be. Now in the case of the first one, in enrollment, once we use the biometric data for uh, deduplication, it's kept offline. So it's not, it's not on the internet or something. So all the biometric data is kept offline. It's encrypted and kept, so it's not, it's not floating around. It's, it's, it's locked out. And even for authentication, we don't use the biometric. We use uh, something called the minutiae extract, which is a sort of a pattern that we extract. So the biometrics is not really available anywhere. It's kept locked, encrypted, offline, and all that. So that's one thing. Second thing is that the information that we collect is actually very minimal. This is not collecting all kinds of data about people. It's only having the basic information to give you an ID. 
and then your authentication happens where you go to present your ID. So, and we have a system, in fact, that every time you do a biometric authentication, you can get a text message to your mobile phone, and therefore you know that it's like you know when you buy something on a credit card, you get a message that you know your card was used. We have a similar thing, so that makes sure that you you know that your that every time you authenticated was a real one and stuff like that. Third thing is that we don't share this data in the sense that it's not that I can call up the system and ask your address. All you can do with the system is do ID verification. So you go somewhere, you say that you're X, and give your biometric, we match it and say yes, he, he or she is X. So the only answer you get from the system is a yes or a no. The fourth thing is that you can use this only the resident can authorize release of his data to somebody else. You know, so I mean, I don't want to get a whole history of how it is, but a lot of focus is there on developing uh, a, a, both a secure and a, a and a private system. Obviously, if this number is going to be in every database, then one could argue that it will be easier to concatenate details from different databases and and create your profile. But that requires a higher higher order thing. It needs a data sharing policy and all that, which, which is parallelly being worked on. But it's important to realize that the ID system does not know how or why the ID was used. If you go to a bank and withdraw 1,000 rupees, and the bank uses the ID system to verify your ID, the ID system knows that you went to the bank and did something. But what you did in the bank, only the bank knows. And therefore, it's designed so that each player is ignorant of the other one, so that you don't have this danger of everybody in one, you know, data in one place. Up there, please. Hi, I'm Melissa Frackman with the U.S. India Business Council. Congratulations on the vast success of the program thus far. Um, there have been many exciting financial inclusion innovations using UID, especially in banking and payments. Do you have sort of a wish list of things you'd like to see that are not currently happening in terms of industry leveraging the platform for better development goals? Yeah, well, uh, I think it's all happening, but it's in the pipeline. The first thing is that we are developing a network of business correspondents. And these business correspondents are going to have a small handheld device, which we have designed and the specifications are on our website. And we're encouraging multiple vendors to develop that. So one thing is vendors can develop new, innovative micro ATMs, as we call them. And, and the banks, we expect, will be rolling out these micro ATMs uh, across the country. And then uh, the next thing is, once we do that, then a person should be able to go in a village in a, uh, a convenient location and withdraw their money from the bank account. The next stage is, you know, why do you need to withdraw money at all? You can make it a cashless transaction, right? You can go to a grocery store and debit your account, buy some stuff and credit the grocer's account. But that's a behavioral change that people will understand only after the they have trust that the money is you know, in and out properly. And then the next thing we have to do is make it work with the mobile network. So there's a whole roadmap. Actually, we have a whole report on the roadmap on this, uh, which is on our website again. And uh, we look forward to all kinds of innovative suppliers using this architecture and, and building this out. So hopefully in the next few years, you'll really have very wide penetration of financial access. Over there? Just up there. A little bit further up, yeah. Um, hi, Shivani Nair from UNDP. Um, you know, beyond giving uh, cash transfers, there's all these other development opportunities that open up with a system like this. For example, uh, quickly, people can build their credit worthiness. They c there can be a credit sto credit score attached to each ID, and this gives access to finance to like people from every strata stratum of society. Uh, I was just wondering if uh, there's thinking in the government or in the wider policy circles about this kind of an application and if there's excitement about this and other possible sure. applications like this. Well, you know, these are all applications that will emerge in time. You know, normally from, as I gave the GPS example, the GPS was launched in uh, sort of commercial usage only in 2000. And, and the maps came in 2006. So it takes time for these things to happen. But we have talked to the four credit rating agencies in India to build a Aadhaar-based rating thing. Because now what you can do is that if, since you actually have that transaction to the person at the point, 
you can then start building the payment history or repayment history, and then you can build a credit system on that, and then you can start giving credit. But these are all will happen in the future. They won't happen uh, overnight, but they will happen. As, as people sort of internalize the potential of this and all that, it, it takes time to, the diffusion takes time, but it'll happen. Yes. Hi, I'm uh, Nikhil Malpani. Um, at the current rate of registration, by when do you expect we, we'll see the entire population getting registered? And uh, how many years away are we from seeing this impacting the country's uh, GDP growth rate? Well, you know, as I said, the system is capable of doing about 200 million people a year. And uh, next year we'll be at 600 million, so you can compute that. But remember that it's not that simple. The enrollment will have a bell-shaped curve. You know, it begins and then it, it now it has the peak of it. But as you go towards the last, say, 300 million, then again, you know, you have to find them, right? So uh, it, it'll again slow down. <laughs> so it, I, I, it, you can't just linearly extrapolate. Think of it as a bell-shaped curve where there's high, and then again, it's, it's a long tail of this thing. So I can't say when it will be done totally. Uh, it's difficult to look at the macroeconomic uh, thing because it will require everyone to be having an ID, everybody to have a bank account, more savings in the, in the banking system. So, you know, these are all macro things, so I leave it to the macroeconomists to... <laughs> Think yes. about it, 300 million people will have to be found, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there. Yes, please. Hi, Paul Eckstein, um, Hoboken, New Jersey. For those of us who are a little bit technical, give us an idea about how big this data is. Are we talking about hundreds of thousands of terabytes, or, I mean, how big is, is yeah, it's this whatever. data? Terabytes, petabytes, whatever the largest category of, okay. <laughs> so. Because, remember, you, on, but you know, it's not a big deal. Think about it. Facebook has a billion users, right? Google is doing a billion YouTube views. Now that's, now, you know, so every one of those billion people has their photographs and their videos and, you know, the dogs and whatnot. So, <laughs> so it's, it, that's, that's the point I'm making that what the internet guys have done is they've enabled the ability to create databases for a billion people and store it and retrieve it. So that's the, great contribution that they have done, which we are leveraging. So they are it for a business reason. We are taking that capability and applying it to, to a development purpose. I know the answer to your question. <coughs> Space is not the problem. Yeah. It's been cracked by somebody else. Well, I'm just curious, of the 300 million or so people that have enrolled, No, 400, do you have, 380 million. Yeah. Three, 380, sorry, close to 400. Do you have any idea how many of these are truly people out of the system and how many are people that already are in the system that already do have PAN cards or bank accounts and are just acquiring another ID? See, out of the population of 1.2 billion, 50 million have passports. That's 5%. 100 million have PAN cards. That's 10%. 200 million or so have driver's license and bank accounts. So you, when we think about all these things like passports or PAN cards, it's really the top end of the spectrum. It's, this is the first, I mean, to be fair, the election commission has done that with voter ID cards. They've done an amazing job, and there are a few hundred million people with voter ID cards above the age of 18. But this is the first universal ID for every man, woman, and child in, in the country. And that's why it, uh, a, lot of the people, a lot of the people we have are people who have maybe voter ID cards have come into the system, or they are a member of a family where they are person number four on a ration card, but now they get their own ID and stuff like that. Let's go on this side. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Nelakani. Is there broad political consensus in India around Aadhaar? Obviously, I imagine there are multitudes of vested interests that are um, potentially adversely impacted by this. And is there broad political consensus such that a change in government doesn't put the program at risk? Well, uh, you know, I think, you know, I think it's now accepted. Uh, certainly at the state level, 
almost every, almost every state is implementing it and as you know the state governments have different political formations so in that sense yes it's bipartisan uh, but the best I guess uh, best thing is having more and more people using it so I uh, you know if uh, we're hoping that by next year we'll have at least half a billion people on the system and millions of people getting money into the bank accounts and all that. So I think the fact that it's well established is the best, whatever, uh, best way to make sure it, it continues. Yeah, over there. Hi. Um, since I, I am an ex-Infosian, I would like to know, was it difficult working in Infosys or was it difficult working in government? I think they're two different experiences. I think uh, uh, I think the big difference, to my mind, in working in the public space is the uh, the number of actors is many more. The number of stakeholders is so much more. You, you know, in, 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 when you work in a company, you have basically your shareholders, your management team, your board, and you know, analysts, and Wall Street, and all that. But fundamentally, you you, you, you need to sort of carry these people along. But when you do a thing like this in the public arena, then you're many more. You have obviously the government, you have the cabinet, you have parliament, you have bureaucracy, you have activists, you have judicial system, you have the people, you have the media. And therefore, the number of actors are many more. And also, they are much more ideologically diverse. You know, in business, everybody is doing the same thing, right? Increasing revenue, reducing cost, making money, and all that. But in this public thing, agendas are very different, right? Ideology, I mean, you have, that's why you have gridlock in politics. So navigating through that multi-stakeholder thing is, is a much more complex challenge in a public area. Yes. I do not intend to talk about it publicly. <laughs> Well, you can read about it if you like. You know, you, you obviously have, but uh, you can read about all the, the kind of people throwing stuff at it. But over there at the back. And <laughs> Hi, Hori. Um, my question is, is this uh, biometric data eventually going to be available to uh, forensics departments uh, within the Sorry? police force? Is the biometric data eventually going to be available to forensics departments within the police department? Police department. See. Uh, there is a law which is being uh, prepared for the UIDI, which defines under what conditions of national security uh, data can be accessed from this database, which is true, by the way, in every part of the world. It happens here, too. It happens everywhere that under certain requirements of national security and terrorism and all that, data is made available. We'll apply the same principles. Yeah, maybe up here, the back, lady. Roma Bhattacharjee yeah, from UNDP. Yeah. Thank you so much for that fascinating talk. My question actually follows from what Ajay said. From the perspective of the internally displaced, and you know, you talked about address as being one criteria of identity, but there are a lot of people in my country who don't have a permanent address, and they're maybe living under a bridge one day or migrant. Uh, how do we solve that issue? Because I work all over the world in war zones and tsunami areas, and this is a huge area of challenge to establish identity. We don't have your sophisticated system, but we do do registration of IDPs and, and uh, tsunami-affected people. So how do we crack that? How do we access people who don't have a permanent residence or a point of location? Yeah. Well, what we have done is uh, we have we have program, for example, in the Delhi, with the, working with the Delhi government, we have a program for enrolling homeless people. And what we do is we work with the Delhi shelter organization and Delhi NGOs. And uh, we organize enrollment camps at the shelter and provide that shelter as the address. And then when the letter comes to them, somebody contacts them and gets them the letter. So we do things like that to address the issue of uh, addresses. And then we have a national update centers when people change the address, they can go and get the address updated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe on this side. Yeah. 
this site here. Thanks for the talk. Uh, um, I was just wondering if um, what sort of communication efforts that you've taken uh, to to actually talk to the people about it. I know there's a buy-in from the government. Uh, I mean, when I was in India, I heard uh, uh, the IDs, uh, the application forms that are, at least in the media, there are, there are mixed messages. I was just wondering what kind of efforts that you're undertaking to um, actually communicate the, the all the positive impact that you can have from the Aadhaar to the people. Well, you know, th we, have, we have a usual, uh, you know, we have mass media, television, newspapers, text messages, holdings, you know, stuff like that. But actually the biggest thing is word of mouth. Our, the, the demand for this is coming from people who are migrants and all that, simply because, I mean, I don't think, it's not that they visualize the whole sort of architecture that I just described, uh, but they definitely know that this is going to be some kind of a gateway. Uh, what that gateway is to which service, they may not be very clear, but I think, so we have huge, I mean, as I said, we are enrolling a million people a day. We have 30,000 enrollment stations, and even then we have huge crowds coming there. So I think that that has been cracked. The, the demand side of it has been cracked. And now, while we do provide, you know, media and all that, fundamentally, I think it's, it's, it's Aadhaar as a brand has been accepted uh, everywhere. It's crossed the tipping point, as they say, right? Over there. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, Mr. Nilekani, you know, you have been doing this for some time now. You must be going and, you know, in universities, you know, with different entrepreneurs, different people must be reaching out to you and telling you that, hey, you know, by Aadhaar plus, you know, putting like credit together, something else together, we can create this development program or this idea. In all these years, what was something that was the most fascinating thing that you heard? Like, wow, I never thought of that. That is the most brilliant idea that you could think of, but you know, <laughs> using that. So could you share one or two like interesting anecdotes? And the reason I ask is, well, a lot of young minds over here can fire our imagination to think about this as well. No, I think uh, we are hearing a lot of interesting things uh, uh, on uh, payments, you know, how we, how we can use this to simplify payments, how we can do mobile payments, how you can, so, I mean, I can't say which of the, I mean, for one of the applications which I never thought about was I was, I was talking to one of the uh, embassies, and they said they could provide a faster track visa with Aadhaar. Because for the embassy, a lot of time goes in making sure the guy is a real guy and collecting the documents and all that, and that whole thing can be streamlined, so they could offer like a faster track visa, so I never thought about visas as an application, but there it is. So all kinds of things like that are, are coming, and, but I think it's early days yet. I mean, I think next four, five years, you'll see some really innovative stuff. Yes, in the middle there. <coughs> Just another five, seven minutes. How much is the time? It's now? 10 to 8. Yeah, five minutes. Uh, thank you. Um, while your system, it seems like it works very well for adults with, you know, 10 fingers and two eyes. How does it handle, you know, babies, young children, cripples, etc.? Yeah, see, we, our mission statement is nobody will be denied an Aadhaar. So that's our philosophy. It's about inclusion, right? Now, as far as biometrics goes, uh, fingerprints stabilize at the age of 15. And uh, the iris stabilizes at the age of 5. So 5 to 15, we take only the iris. 15 above, we take the fingerprints and the iris. Below five, we do give a number, but we attach it to a guardian or a mother so that to prevent duplication. And then when that child reaches the age, then they have to come in and give the biometrics and uh, update that. Uh, we also have things called biometric exceptions. So if somebody doesn't have fingers or whatever, then we enable that. But our basic philosophy is nobody should be denied a number. Uh, I was just a little curious about uh, when somebody is awarded an Aadhaar, is it a de facto award of citizenship or no. residence in the country? No, it is only a number saying that X is X. It is not a proof of citizenship. So 
then the authorities have to go back and verify that when he... No, there, I mean, whatever is the process of citizenship establishment continues. All that you're saying is Ram is Ram or Ashok is Ashok. So the Ashok is a citizen, Ashok is a Martian, you know, that's a different... Uh, <laughs> So what about people who, let's say, cr the migrants who cross over from other countries and, and try to settle down in India, and they're identified, so what, uh, what is their status? No, the, 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 here the goal is clear, giving a resident uh, ID number. So the, there's obviously, you know, there, there are other people who look at who should be, a, who's a citizen and all that. So they'll have to do that, that, that role. This, this number is for all residents. Not, if you see the letter, it very clearly says this is not a proof of citizenship, so it's still behoves on the appropriate agency to establish those kind of things. We are only saying, we are only giving a people an online ID that they can use for accessing transactions. So let's take last two questions up there, please. The gentleman in the blue shirt. Okay. Uh, this, uh, I was struck by your talking about the transformation, basically, of society, um, or the, on the way towards the transformation of society, where the power rested in the, in the giver and now rests with the receiver. I'm sorry, He's I didn't asking, you know, well, the power that people get because they can use multiple. Yeah, yeah, so is the question or? So the question is, are there similar kind of major, major uh, social effects coming out of this? You know, on that order, that's a, that's a big change to transfer power from the person that, you, yeah. You as a receiver had to be beholden to, and now you are beholden to yourself, period, yeah. and that yeah. you hold the power. Yeah, I, I think that's a very, very acute uh, observation. I think, I mean, there, there may be others, I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the choice that we give, and therefore you decide where to go and get your thing. And also the convenience that you get, right? I mean, if, if, if like, you, we have a situation at home where someone who works with us is a widow, and she gets a widow's pension. And uh, she, when she needs to claim her widow's pension, she takes the day off and goes to another town where her account is, because that's the only place she can get the widow's pension. And she spends that day traveling. She, she spends money on the bus and all that stuff. So it's obviously a very inconvenient way of accessing her widow's pension. Tomorrow, when the system is rolled out, there'll be a neighborhood grocery store who'll have an outlet. She can go and take her money from her account there, and therefore, instead of spending a whole day, she's going to spend 15 minutes. So I think the convenience part is also a huge thing. Because what has happened is that, you know, for those who have purchasing power, markets have given that, right? But for people who are essentially still relying on public, you know, income or entitlement support from the state, their systems have not been reformed, and therefore they have this uh, relationship, which I think changing that is, is definitely the biggest, and I'm sure there'll be other benefits too. Yes. The um, you mentioned a bit about um, the political dimension. There's also been criticism about the Aadhaar on how it might be politicized itself and used in elections. I'd love to hear your comments on that. I know uh, it might be a sensitive topic, so uh, whatever you can say to us would be, we'd be very grateful to hear it. Well, you know, that's really not, uh, you know, it's outside you know, the domain of this. Uh, our goal is to provide a platform which makes life better for millions of people, and I think that, that's the mandate I have, that's what we're doing. Now, obviously different people you know, we'll look at how to, uh, you know, look at it from that angle. But it's better that I stay out of that conversation. Let's take one last one here. The lady here. Yeah. Give me the mic. <clears throat> Hi, um, my name is Shushu. Thanks for the speech. My question is like, um, it's about privacy too. So whenever I have to identify myself uh, with your biometric system, means that someone knows where I am, no? And that happens today. <laughs> when you go to the bank to withdraw your money, they want to know who you are so that you can take out from your account and not somebody else's. You're doing it every time you go somewhere. 
when you go to the bar, you're showing your proof of age. When you go to bar, you know. What I'm saying is that you are revealing yourself all the time. When you board a plane, you're showing your ID. It's like a GPS system, so everybody knows who, who, I mean, who I am. <laughs> not, not everybody, but just like you have no, no privacy no, when, when where you When you go are and, uh, you know, buy a car, you're giving your uh, details. When you go and take a loan, you're giving your history of your credit. When you're going to the doctor, you're giving your health ailments. You're, I mean, we are always trading information for a convenience. Well, thank you thank so you. much, Nandan. This has been, you know, absolutely uh, fascinating. <laughs> I just want to, um, I, I know Tom wants to thank everybody, but let me first just say, uh, you know, we actually, I have to reveal a little bit uh, how lucky we are to have Nandan here today, because when I went to see him, and I said to him, uh, when would you be coming to the United States and could we get you to speak about Aadhaar here? He said he doesn't really travel. He's been so focused on this that he's uh, not been traveling at all out of the country. And he said, but there is this one week that I might be in New York and in the United States for personal reasons. And so I asked then Liz Grande, who's here from, uh, who's the UN resident coordinator in India, to go and pester Nandan to, uh, to you know, remind him also that he had promised to give this talk. So we, we don't know how lucky we are to have him because of this one week where he took to come here. But uh, thank you also to Tom and to uh, Asia Foundation for hosting us and, and to all my colleagues at UNDP, Palaniwal, who's been, uh, and other colleagues who've helped so much to all the people who've been helping us with the Q's and A's and, uh, and everything around this uh, program has been wonderful. So thank you again, Tom, and thank, thank you. you, Nandan, for sure. giving us this unique opportunity. <laughs> if I can just add, on behalf of the Asia Society, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I have a very mundane question in my mind, and perhaps I know you have no spare time whatsoever, but when you have a little spare time, or maybe when you're done with the Atar project, perhaps on behalf of the Americans here, you can come and fix our medical record system in this country. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because the next time we go and see the clipboard and have to fill all that stuff in again. <laughs> just, um, right, voter registration, sure. Uh, I actually just want to add one more thank you. You mentioned the Q&A, and I had said at the outset what metrics make a good program here, but I have to say, you know, we are here almost every night, and those were some of the best questions, so thank you to the audience uh, for coming and for your great questions, but mostly uh, thanks to both of you. You uh, were terrific. It's a great conversation. Give us a ton to think about, and you are welcome anytime. So thank you very much.